praise the Lord. Um, Apostle Dr. Robert, please pray for me and just release me. I know you've already done all of that, but I just want you to oh, pray. Let me, let me turn the mic back on. Okay. Amen. Stretch your hands toward her. Father, we just give release to this, this apostle of the Lord that you have sent into this place. We say as a city and as a region and as an ecclesia, we receive her. Just stretch your hands and say, we receive. Lord, we receive. You said the, the, the word of the Lord says that if we receive the one that comes in the name of the Lord, then we'll receive what they're carrying in the blessing of us. So just say, we receive you. We release you. We, we take every limitation off. We release every, we, we release every judging spirit, every critical spirit. We let it go, and we open our spirits to receive the depth of what God has sent you to deliver. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to be with you. I'm going to just speak a little bit so you can tune into the accent. Uh, did you know I had one? Or is it you that has one? Okay. I'm very excited to be here. It, there's a, a lot of places I go to, you can only go to the, um, to the limit of, of the foundation that you're invited to speak from. And um, Apostle Robert really understands the government, governmental issues, and that means we can just go for the throat. And I'm that kind of person. So um, I don't really, I'm not very fluffy. I know I look female and I'm not really very fluffy. So let me do the fluffy part quickly. I just want to tell you that I really enjoy Dr. Robert Henderson. I'm going to tell you why, Mary. Um, because he stood up. And he said, what is really going on? And he stood up in ICA and said, you know what? Um, there's a survey by, who was it again? George Barner, who said, uh, asked people in America, why does the church exist? And 86% of church-going America said, to meet my needs. Well, I nearly jumped through my skin, freaked out, did a dance because I, could, I couldn't have said it better. Um, I don't believe that's why the church exists. I believe we are God's dream. And he paid for his dream with his son's blood. And I actually want to make a statement to you. I don't care what your ministry is about. I don't care what you're here for. I want to tell you I am only here to serve one thing. And it's what the blood of Jesus is speaking right now. And if you can agree with that, we'll, we'll do fine. And if you don't want to agree with that, you're in the wrong place. Let me smile <laughs> at this juncture. But um, I liked Apostle Robert because he agreed with that kind of thing. He said, we are here to be the government of God on the earth. Now, right now, I don't know if you noticed, but all governments and money are combined together. Did you know? Being in government is about money. Having money is being able to have all the jobs, the tender to build the city, to do whatever. And generally, all of that comes from the little boys' club. You know which kind of club, you know? They have these funny little symbols. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge, and say no more. You know what I mean? Somehow we have a, a little small bunch of people running the world and the church has been in Kumbaya land or somewhere or they've been soaking <laughs> something or they've been sipping something. We would like to get to do something. This is an empowerment conference so that hopefully when you leave here, you'll be doing something. Hello? It is only children who want to keep receiving. If you came here because you want your needs met, you are three. 
And if you moan about it, you're even younger. <laughs> you know what? J.F. Kennedy said something very good. Don't ask. What was that thing? What you can do? What your country? So let me, let me translate. Don't ask Jesus to do something else for you that he hasn't already done. It's time for you to show up for the position he paid for you to be doing with his blood. And if you're not doing it, where are you? Okay, we'll repent in a minute. I would really recommend you get this book. It's called Repentance. Okay, the reason you want to get this book is because I am in no way going to be able to get through all the stuff that's in there and get to all the scriptures and do it all very nicely in Hebrew and Greek and blah, blah, blah. Okay, because we want to do some stuff here tonight as well. Okay, so I'm, I'm having a struggle going from Deliverance 101 to dealing with governmental stuff and everything in between. So just, you know, kind of roll with me here. I also am not going to release Katie yet because she's going to start speaking stuff and you're going to go, huh? So I want to just fill in some things before we do that. This is okay. So let's just go to Isaiah 2 for a moment. Let's just deal with the mountain issue. Mountains are governments. If you're writing notes, put their mountain equals government or high place or governmental system, something like that. Okay. In Africa, when you go to visit a witch doctor, a shaman, okay? Everybody here? You either say, I'm going to go see the witch doctor, Mr. So-and-so, whatever, or you say, I'm going to the mountain. Got it? So, guess what? God also rules from a mountain. The mountain is a government. It is a structure. It is not your ministry. In fact, let me tell you, your ministry is supposed to be part of his mountain. If it isn't, then you isn't got one. <laughs> and what you have is floating somewhere. Is not part of anything. And is probably in a parallel world with a parallel heaven with its own angels and visitations and all kinds of parallel things. And heaven has never heard of you. It's going to be very frightening. You know, all those people that get to heaven, what's that scripture that says, Lord, Lord? And then, haven't you heard of me? I was on the front page of Charisma, Lord. <laughs> in fact, I was on TVN, Lord. In fact, you don't recognize me. I was doing all those crusades in Africa, in fact, you know, and miracles. And, and Jesus says, do I know you? And the word no is a marital word for no. In other words, if I don't know you, then how did you produce what you produced? Because my seed is not in here and it's not my DNA. So who did you actually sleep with? That is what he's saying. Because everything God is talking about ends up being government and who you're married to. Hello? Smile. We are all adults here. Hallelujah. Isaiah 2, are you there? Verse 2, now it shall come to pass in the latter days. Are we in the latter days? Hello? Some of you don't know where you are. So if your neighbor didn't answer, tell them this means we now, you know, latter days. That the mountain of the Lord's house. Did you see that? The Lord's house, which we're supposed to be part of, is a what? A mountain or a government. So if you're part of the Lord's house, you have to be part of a, a government. Yes? Yes. Okay. So somewhere, whatever house you're part of is supposed to fit into a mountain. Are we here yet? Okay. 
shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow to it. So what are we supposed to have dominion over? Try all nations. Like all. Okay. Many people shall come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord. Okay. To the house of the God of Jacob. Jacob is the guy who wrestles. Like who? Paul wrestles with principalities and powers. Peter wrestles with... Are you, are you yeah. getting this? Jacob. House of the God of Jacob, the wrestler. Say yes. Yeah. He will teach us his ways. We need to go up to do what? To learn something. The way he does it. My ways are not your ways. You better come up here to learn what my ways look like. And we shall do what? Walk. This word walk usually comes out of a root word for halak, H-A-L-A-K, which means Adam walked with God as halak, right? Lucifer walking on uh, fiery stones is yalak or halak. Walking with God in Zechariah is halak. I want to, you to walk here. Amongst these you stand here. If you will walk in my ways, I'll give you place to stand. Amongst these. Okay. Walking somehow is important to God. In fact, the early days, the Christians were called the way or those who walked with God. Go back to rabbinical times. You walked with God. The people who were the most senior were the ones who walked with God on a daily basis. Adam walked with God every day. Hello? Then we lost that position, which means we don't know what's going on in the government of heaven because we aren't walking. Hello? You've got to get back to walking to get reconnected in what's going on with the government. Yes, because God walks with Adam every day. So God goes, creates whole new universes and star systems and whatever, comes back and walks with Adam. So, Adam, how was your day? No, well, I named the giraffe today and the hippopotamus. Well, very good. What did you do, God? Well, you know, I made a few more new universes out there and the universe expanded today by so many light years and I'm very excited about this other solar system over there. How do you have a conversation with a God like that? Well, you, you better start studying to show yourself Approved. Approved for what? A relationship to walk with God in government. Why? I just want to be blessed and saved. Right? Why can't we just be blessed and saved and get our needs met and go home? Because God didn't create us for that. God created us for what? What did he create us for? He actually thinks that we should look like him. Isn't that crazy? God wants us to look like him. He actually wants us to act like him. He actually wants us to like mimic what he does. How's that? He wants us to co-rule and reign with him. Right? Hello? Yes. So we think fighting for a position in church, that's ruling. Listen, there are stars out there that you've never heard of, and scientists are not even going to discover yet. Okay? There are so many angels out there of different tribes. We don't even know what they look like yet. But God wants us, Jesus wants us to sit with him in his throne and rule with him. Now, how ridiculous is that? And then the most ridiculous part is, I don't want you to be critical and judge one another because surely you have a court system amongst yourselves <clears throat> to deal with things in, you know, amongst church people. Like, why do you have to take your brother to court? Don't you know you're going to be judging the world? In fact, you will be judging angels. Tell the person next to you, study to show yourself approved. 
How are you going to rule angels if you don't know the first thing about what they do? But your job, don't you know, is to rule angels. How are we doing? So here's peanut gallery here. Okay. We hardly know what's going on. And there's these angels, thousand feet foot tall, being in the glory forever, and we are going to do what? Well, Lucifer's very upset about this. Yeah, very upset. So he's going to keep you confused forever. And he's going to tell you, listen, don't worry about anything. Just sit on your blessed assurance and get to heaven. You know? Don't worry about anything. Don't push for anything. Don't try. Don't fight me. Don't do anything significant. Just get to heaven. And most people are cooperating. Yeah, you know that we believe this this uh, deception. If you don't fight with him, he won't come looking for you. Really? Okay. So it says here we're going to go to the mountain of the Lord. Why? to his house. Why? Because we need to learn something that we right now don't know. How are we doing? And we were going to walk. That's why you're going to bring your offering. You're going to literally walk to these baskets. Because Lucifer walked up and down on the fiery stones before God, trading. We're supposed to take his place. Hello? You're not sure? Nobody's sure. Hello? Are you here? We are supposed to take his place, says all the worship leaders, and bless you, worship leader. I'm going to hit this thing. We're supposed to take his place and sing the hallelujah chorus forever. Because he got thrown out of heaven. Really? Go read why he got thrown out of heaven. It wasn't because he missed the note. <laughs> it was because he traded with corruption and violence. Say hello. Yes. So we have got to start walking in the place that he vacated. There's a place in the garden that he got us out of walking with God. And there's a place on the sea of glass that he got, got us out of. Well, if I was you, I'd decide I'm going to go walk exactly where he doesn't want me to walk. Because that needs to be where I am. Are you hearing me? Government has to do with walking with God. Adam was in a place of governance and dominion. And you saw it because he walked every day with God. Then, of course, what happens is we have Lucifer looking at this little number and saying, now listen, we've got to trip up this walk because this is not good for me. I have got to swap this walk to walking with me. So let's go have a conversation with Eve and confuse the whole issue. Okay? And the next thing you know, they are walked out, escorted out of a garden. Say yes. And the whole issue is Jesus comes because John prepares the way so that every mountain can be brought down so that all the governments now that Lucifer has set up is now going to be made flat so they're walkable. This is the year 2011. The word, the, the number 11 in Hebrew is kaf, the word for K, K A P H, okay, where you get kavod, glory. Kafar to cover, and a number of other things. But the one thing that's very interesting with this cuff thing is the sole of the foot or the palm of the hand. 
This is 2011. 11 stands for if you can put the sole of your foot on its neck, you can take it with your hand. That's what 11 is for. Because you see, the sole of your foot has got this nice little arch thing there. Okay, in, in Hebrew, it's, it's, it's the name, it would be like sole of the hand, sole of the foot. It like they don't have a different one for the hand and the foot. It's the same kind of description. So if you can walk it, you take it. Walking is about dominion. It's about that arch of your foot going on the ground. And everything that's on the ground, you're supposed to take its neck and not bless it, break it. It's a sign of authority to walk. Right? That's why every place on which your, the sole of your foot takes, you can have that. So this is 2011. There's some things you need to take now because it's already long enough. Overdue for some of you and too long. Some of you are so despairing because you've got these prophetic words and you've had these things said and you've believed all this stuff and nothing has happened. Anybody there? Well, you know, sometimes you need a change of technology. Do you know what I'm saying? You need a change of understanding. You need some wisdom. You need something to shift. Because if it's working the way it was, no one would be frustrated. No one would be restless. Right? If everything was so gorgeous because Jesus did it all, Yes, Jesus did it all, didn't he? Yes, he did. He did everything he's going to do. And then what happened? We all sat on our blessed assurance. The issue is not about their blessed assurance. It's about the foot walking. So that you haven't taken your ground. Okay? And, and if you've tried to, maybe it wasn't on the mountain. Maybe it wasn't on God's trading floor. Are you with me? Maybe you've claimed something outside of the anointing. You see, there are kairos moments in God that you have to go and stand in and walk in and take it. And a way to do that is trading. I'm going to just say something very quickly about trading because I'm trying to just do 20 things at once. <coughs> Do you remember Abraham comes to Melchizedek in Genesis 14? What happens? He gives him a war tax. Because you would pay the king over you a tithe if he went to fight for you. So if, if the Egyptian pharaoh goes against the Assyrian king, the Assyrian king would go and do his worship service, kill his kids, pour blood on the altar, have a sexual orgy, give a thousand oxen, whatever it takes, baby, before he goes to battle. He gets himself psyched up. His troops are psyched up. They do everything right according to who they are worshipping. How are we doing? What does the Egyptian guy do? Exactly the same thing. Then they go to war. Now, depending on who wins, the other guy puts his foot on the guy's neck, tears the guy apart or takes him on hooks back home or tortures him horribly or whatever. Go read your Bible. Yes. And then takes all his villages, burns them down, takes the woman, uh, puts the men, either kills them or makes them his soldiers. Renames all their villages, all their cities. How are we sounding? So the people would gladly pay a tithe. Otherwise they are dead. It's very simple. 
They are dead. Their whole family is gone. Gives you a whole different perspective of why they brought money to the feet of the apostles. Because the apostles were seen as the guys going to war. When Paul goes to Ephesus, he's at war with Diana. And he's successfully winning. Otherwise, they wouldn't have had a riot. And they, these guys freak out because they're making money on the government of Diana. So the whole economy is going to shift because all these silversmiths are not going to sell Diana's statue because he has Jesus. So they don't know what he looks like. So how can they make silver statues of him and make money yet? The Roman Catholics haven't come in with these statues. I was brought up Catholic. And, you know, to pay to not to go to hell and to get the bishop or the pope to tell you it's fine. You know, to say, don't worry, you can kill 10 people, we'll just forgive you. How are we doing? Smile. Anyway, the issue is government, religion, Taxes and economies are all very nicely married together. And you pay somebody. Hello? Depending on what is ruling, you're paying it. You're paying it in your attitude. You're paying it in your fear. You're paying it in the way you pray, but you're paying. Okay. We know as the church of Jesus Christ, we get to face Antichrist. Right? So are we ready? Are we fighting ready yet? No, not while we're still licking our wounds and feeling sorry for ourselves. And coming for more ministry. Hello? Smile at me. When Abraham comes to Melchizedek, he's giving his tithe because he just won against five kings. It says in Hebrews 7 that Levi is also receiving tithes, but Levi is not born yet for four generations. So when you deal with money, you're affecting four generations at the least. When you trade with one dollar, your Levi for generations from you right now is being affected. And if you David, you affect a thousand generations. So, think about this. When you trade tonight, you're moving something in the future now. The book of Ecclesiastes says, everything that is, has already been. Say yes. So this meeting has already been. And your Levi is already registering a breakthrough or not. And everything that will be, has already happened. Okay, how are we doing? This is the Bible. Ecclesiastes 3, you know, after a time and a time and a time and all the times. It's, this is what it says. God is outside of time. When you step onto a trading floor, you're not in time anymore. Because you're already trading into the future. Why do you think they call it the futures? I wonder where they got it from. Smile. Some of you are having a hard time. I can just see. Just go. <laughs> it's going to get worse. <laughs> so when Abraham gives his tithe, and if Levi is there four generations later, where is 
Abraham's son. What's his name? Isaac. Where's he? And where's his son, Jacob, who is the father of Levi? So we've got Isaac and Jacob. Where are they? Here's Abraham and Levi. So where do you think the two fathers are from in between? Talk to me. They're there as well at the same time. Yes. Because how can Abraham be there and Levi be there? We have to understand. The other two are there too, right? Four generations. Say yes, four generations. So if Levi is giving something and Abraham is giving something to Melchizedek, Isaac and Jacob are doing what? Uh -huh. So if Levi is there and he's the ancestor of David and everybody in between, do you think David's there? Sure. Of course. And where are you then? You were there as well. Because don't you know Abraham is our father? And we are part of that seed. Hello? So when we trade, we connect to the first trade. Don't you understand? Everything we do is not about you on your own. It's corporate. You have to trace everything to be corporate as well as individual. So what you have to do, you have to do in holiness, in purity, in protocol, understanding that you are fulfilling something that your fathers and mothers have already begun. Your job is to finish it and finish it well. So you can't just arrive, lily of the valley, you know, wonderful idea, and just do whatever. Your whatever has to fit in to generations who have already stood on the sea of glass to trade with God. Your prayers have got to fit in with every prayer of every person who's ever lived. Revelations 8 says all the prayers of all the saints who ever lived are added together before there's a final judgment. Your prayers are already being registered right now. Your prayers have already happened, but it says in Ecclesiastes, you have now shown up to look like what already is, was, and will be. Okay. Now you, I'm going to confuse you thoroughly. In the beginning, there was a lamb who was slain before the foundation of the, thank you. That's the what. Then he came and he was the lamb 2,000 years ago in now time. Yes? And this lamb was Jesus who became the crucified one. Yes? In the now. Who was, who is, and we have to have a lamb who is to come in the future. And he's there in Revelations 5 as the lamb who has been slain. Who sounds like a lion, but when I look at him, I see a lamb. And you see, if I am baptized into him, into his death, his burial, and his resurrection, then I am in him. 2,000 years ago when he was on the cross. Hello? Yes. And then if I was there in him in the now, I must have been him before. Come on, talk to me. Before when? The fun and then if I'm there, then I have to be in him in the future. When every tribe and tongue and people group will sing, worthy is the lamb 
who was slain, who made us to be kings and priests unto our God by your blood. And you have redeemed us. Are you with me? So if God, holy, 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 to him who was, who is, and if I'm in him, then I'm in the, what, and I'm in the, and I'm in the, at the same time. Smile. Don't you know you're immortal? And somewhere in the glory, God created you to look like him. And a book was written. Psalm 139, every day that you would live before you lived. Is that true? Are we sure? Some of you are not sure. Hello? Is God eternal? Is he your father? When he breathed into Adam, did that breath arrive then? Or was it eternal? Let's go again. When God, who is eternal spirit, yes, breathes into Adam, what kind of a spirit did he breathe into Adam? Eternal spirit. Mm -hmm. So the dream of who you were was always in him eternally. Hello? How old are you really? <laughs> okay, I'm really messing with you tonight. <laughs> you didn't get born on your birthday. That was just you taking a breath of air when you came out of your mother's womb and saying hi to the world. Happy birthday to you. You are an eternal person. Because the spirit on the inside of you is how old? Ancient of days. Smile. It's just a package that's temporary. This package has a shelf life. <laughs> the shelf is earth. Hello? Smile. This woman's weird, hey? <laughs> She says things so differently. Yes, I'm just tilting your brain. Okay? Now, I love this illustration, and I did it when I was here last. I don't know who of you saw in the movie called The Born Identity. There was an old one, there was a new one, and they had like a couple of series with it. Somebody know what I'm talking about? Somebody see 007 movies? Know what I'm talking about? This is a trained agent. He speaks many languages, has many disciplines, has many gifts, all on the inside, has a memory loss. Do you know, if you came from eternity, the gifts on the inside of you are incredible, imaginable, unbelievable. Just needs the right atmosphere to break open. You don't even know how incredible you are because if you look like God, you have to be phenomenal on the inside there. The problem is you think you were born on your birthday. You think, yeah, your limitation is that you think you're American. Hmm. So you, you learned what your teachers told you. Some of your teachers told you you were stupid and you would never amount to much. Or whatever. Okay, I'm trying to break through that limitation and say, God who breathed life into you, there's no limitation in that. The fact that you are here is you are here to come to the measure of the stature of who you were when you stood before him on the sea of glass and said, send me to earth. I want to be alive in 2011 because I want to be a part of fulfilling kingdom assignments on earth in that day. You chose to be here right now. Do you know that? 
You didn't get born by accident, by mistake. I don't care what your family history is. You chose to be here because you said, God, I want the biggest fight there is. And God says, okay, agent, 00777. <laughs> I'm sending you out of here with every gift and every ability and every possibility on the inside of you, which unfortunately you have to have amnesia. And you're going to have to learn from talking to growing to becoming the giant that you really are. There's a picture of you in the glory. This is the judgment. The books will be opened. We will see the picture of who you have become through the trials and tribulations in this life compared to who you were in the beginning. I'm not worried about did you sin, didn't you sin, did you do it right, didn't you? we know all of that. This is the question. I was born in the glory of God. I was birthed in his thinking. I'm part of his dream. His son Jesus was so excited by me that he came to die for me to come into the fullness of what he called me for before the foundation of the earth. And we stood in the council of God and agreed together. And everybody was there. You see, if Abraham is there and Isaac and Jacob and Levi and everybody when we trade, don't you know that when we made the decision to come to earth, we were all there. And Peter and Paul said, I want to, we want to be there in the beginning when Jesus arrives. And God said, okay, go, go. And Elijah said, I want to be there. I want to deal with Jezebel. Okay, you're a son. You can do that one. Hudson Taylor said, I want China. You said, give me Colorado Springs. Or something. I don't know what you said. Or where you're from. Hello? But you chose something. And you agreed with God. And you're here now breathing. And you better not go home until you have fulfilled your assignment. And come to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ that you looked like before in him. Because he came and he shed his blood to guarantee that regardless of the opposition, regardless of what your family looks like, Regardless of the money, regardless of what you're going through, you can come to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Okay, some of you are processing. You thought, oh no, Jesus is going to do this for me. I'm going to walk up there. She's going to lay hands on me. I'm going to feel better. The song leader is going to sing a song. I'm going to get a goosebump on the goosebump. <laughs> Do you know when you get the glory? When you finish the job. Not before. John 17 says, verse 4, this is Jesus speaking, last will and testament before he gets crucified. He says, I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. The glory is coming when you do your job. If you aren't employed, no glory. Do you have a job? Yes, it's written in your scroll. Hello? And it's locked on the inside of you. And you've got to get out of amnesia. And remember why you are here. 
Hello? How are we doing? And then it says something over here. It says, um, verse 22, And the glory which you gave me I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. I and them, you and me, that they may be made perfect in one. Verse 23. Verse 24, John 17, Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am. Where is he? On a throne. What's Jesus' ambition for you? Sit on a seat, a throne. What's your ambition? Hawaii, a beach with a pineapple drink, if you really want to know. I'm serious. I'm just telling you where the flesh is. That's where my flesh is. Hello. The spirit is w willing and the flesh will be dragged. Whether it likes it or not, it's coming kicking and screaming or anyhow, it's coming anyway. Okay. So it says, <laughs> okay, that they may behold my glory, which you have given me. All right. I'm going to just say this to you one more time. We think glory is gold dust. We think glory is being touched till we shake. Now, let me just describe again to you what Jesus says is the glory. It's the glory that he's going to get after he's done what? Finished the work that he was given. In other words, the reason he was sent, what was written in his scroll, he has literally achieved. Why are you studying to show yourself approved? You must study what's in your scroll to go do it. So that the work that God gave you before you left heaven. Yes. Say yes. yes. Like you know what I'm talking about. Okay. That's what you're interested in fulfilling. Yes. Amen. So some of the things that you're trying to do, you might need to just let go right now. Things that other people think you should be doing, things that your parents thought you should be doing, your teacher thought you should be doing, people in your church think you should be doing, your friends think you should be doing. If you don't come out, 007-777 agent from heaven, there's something not going to be completed. How are we doing? So, let's confuse everybody, Lucifer says. They're going to walk with me. I need them in covenant with me. Right? I need these people dead, bleeding, and, and feeding my altars somewhere. In every African village, your name is on an altar. Not your name, but every African who is born has an altar of origination. Smile. Now, all the white people here who think there's no altars in your life, Who's got British roots? All British roots? British roots, yes. Before you came to America, British roots, wave. You're all in Stonehenge. If you haven't taken your name off, it's still there. Smile. It's getting exciting here. At least the Africans and the first peoples here know that their name's on the altar. You guys are confused. You think there's no such thing? Ha ha. Really? <clears throat> That's why you have these wonderful days of trick and treat here. It's your altar speaking, you know. Let me smile while I'm freaking you out. Okay. Every single altar that you're connected to wants rent. Demands payment. Pay me, baby. And if all your ancestors promised things to the altars for harvest, for children, for money, for power, for whatever, right? Yes? When they die, 
where do the principalities, the demons, go to collect their rental from? To the next in line. So, that is why we do generational bloodline curses, because we are tired of paying rent. Yes, I'm making it very simplified. Jesus took away the note, the bond, the legal decree, the documentation that is against you through your family and all the promises everybody ever made from Stonehenge to whatever, altars, and the gods that they serve, right? That's why you have genetic issues. And you ask, the doctor will ask you, tell me your family history. Well, you know, we have a history of heart attack. And we have cancer of whatever. And we have da-da-da-da-da-da. What's that? Those are iniquities. Yes, weaknesses. Very nicely, the scientific community knows more than we do. Apparently, your genetic code is written in your DNA. Yes? And your DNA isn't about how tall you are and what the color of your eyes are. That's 10%. The rest of your DNA is a listening device. I'm going to say it again. The rest of your DNA is a listening device. It's a tuning fork. It's waiting for the right vibration, frequency, sound, word, understanding, wisdom, something. And when it gets it, it clicks in and gets all excited. That's why you like prophecy. Because it's, it touches sometimes something in the tuning fork. You go, Whoa, yes, that's me. Yeah, that's what you're looking for. Because it helps the amnesia. <laughs> it's a clue. Okay? How are we doing? So you're starting to get reconnected to the reason you hear. Are you with me? Okay. This is what they say in genetics, that you have weaknesses and strengths in all your DNA. And guess what is the solution? You can switch off the bad genes and switch on the better genes by prayer and meditation having less stress in your life, and eating the right food. Translation. If you get the right revelation, the right food, the right meat, you're eating the right food, and then you get, begin to get into prayer and, and meditation, you'll be less stressed because you'll know what you're doing and where you're going. Hallelujah. And then you're going to turn off the bad genes and push in the right ones and then suddenly you will remember why you were right, why you are here isn't that fantastic well i'm here to tell you you're here as a kingdom agent to tell principalities and powers what is the wisdom of god that he already foreknew and spoke through jesus christ Hello? And you, the pipsqueak, the peanut gallery, are going to speak to thousands and millions of years old angels and judge them. That's quite a... How's that for a ministry? It's heavy, man. That's, that's a heavy governmental job. And Jesus... Wants you to have it. And do you know what that glory looks like? Well, you can't see his face when he's in judgment because lightnings and thunderings are coming out of it. You can't see his eyes because it's like many diamonds with a fire behind it. You can't see his mouth because when he speaks, swords come out or, or fire comes out. The bottom half of his body is like shining brass. And his ambition for you is that you would look exactly like 
that. I don't know what your ambition is for yourself, but I promise you, whatever you think your ministry is, it's a whole lot less. How are we doing? You are going to look spectacular. Moses had a spectacular moment when he came down from receiving the law, which we just celebrated yesterday, by the way. We're in the end of Pentecost. Guess what? He looked like God. He came off the mountain. Imagine, Steven Spielberg had not been around. So these people try to look at this man's face. And they say, they're trying to describe something, so they're saying it's shining. Now, has anybody's shining face ever made you feel like you're going to go blind before? No. That's what it means to be in the glory. It's to look like who you were in him over here. And so he packaged us in mud. And gave us a shelf life and said, I'm sending you to explode darkness. Okay, if you can just get over yourself. Because most of your time you're looking in the mirror and going, oh my God, the shelf life. It's a billion dollar industry but don't you know that's not who you are when that peels off we'll see you for you who you really is was and always hopefully because the, in the resurrection 1 Corinthians 15 you're going to come to that measure and there's one glory of the moon and one glory of the sun and star differs from star and glory in other words you will choose the glory that you will stay in for the rest of eternity from here on in The bad news is some people are going to flick like Bix in the stars out there. Some stars are pretty like, kind of not really noticeable. And some are very bright. It takes lots of trials to make gold, it says. Right? How are we doing? What has this got to do with generational whatever? Everything. Because the life is in the blood and you're carrying history in your blood. They have now proved that your heart carries genetic memory. This is science, not the Bible. There's an there's a organization called heartmap.org. Not born again, but they say that your heart literally has its own brain and the heart remembers. And they actually had this, some funny movies about some guy who hated black people, white guy in America, and he died. I never saw this movie. Somebody you know, told me about it. So this is like the fourth hand, fifth hand version, so just don't worry about it. So if I get it wrong, it's okay. I'm trying to get a principle over so this guy dies in a car accident. At the same time, we have a black guy waiting for a heart. This white man's heart, who doesn't like black people, gets put into a black body. Suddenly, this black man who didn't like white people very much loves white people because the heart remembered. There was cases, a literal case of a, of a woman who died she had been raped and murdered, and her heart was put into someone, and this person had dreams of what happened. Finally went to the place, to the street, to the door, saw the man. The man was convicted because when, when this person went and said, listen, you killed this person. Her heart remembered. This is science, not the Bible. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And so heart math have now proved that your heart, when you think, your heart frequency is measured up to eight foot around you. 
So when you're sitting there thinking, what is this woman going to say? It's hitting me because I'm in eight feet. And I can hear you and feel it. And when we get together and we all agree, then the frequency that we're all thinking begins to pulsate. I would like to think we can reach China with our heart. How are we doing? Some of our hearts are carrying genetic memory of things we have to resolve, which you may or may not know about. It doesn't really matter. It's there. It's being carried by you in this mud pack. Okay, so when you inherited this mud pack, you got packaged in a package with all kinds of inequities that you inherited, you know, with weaknesses on certain things, whether it was your eyes or whatever. Okay? Everybody with me? At the same level, you inherited things in the spirit and you inherited things in the, in the way you think, the way you make decisions, the way you reason, the way you have your emotions. Yes? Now, your job is to take all of that and begin to look like Jesus. Out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And then bring the whole tribe that you're in or the nation that you're in to the redemptive purpose of God because you have repented for everything that you are carrying. Because if you can do that, then you become a witness in the court to shift a whole nation. We're not interested in repentance so you can feel good. We're interested in repentance so we can go to court and chop a principality's head off. But as long as you think it's all about you, you won't ever repent because you can't admit that you were ever wrong about anything, now can you? Because what would the neighbors say and what would they think? Never mind the neighbors. I want to inform you that everybody has a recording angel following you around wherever you go, writing down everything you think. Think. We worried about what we say, and we think we can think our own private little thoughts, and no one is ever going to know. Really? Do you know the angels are not stupid? And they're writing down everything you're thinking. So when you're going glory, hallelujah, and you look just right in this meeting, and your heart is going, I wish I could slap that woman, because <laughs> seriously... <laughs> The angel got glory, hallelujah, and I think I want to slap that woman. <laughs> you have to get to a place where everything you think is intentional. Every thought and word has to be intentional. When God comes and deals with the people at Babel, he says every thought... An intention of the heart of men was wicked continuously, so therefore, are you hearing this? Why did we think that we can say whatever, but on the inside, hello? Somebody's confused, and it isn't God, and it isn't his angels. Okay, let's just deal with another thing. I'm laying a foundation, if you don't mind. Matthew 23. I have so many arguments on this issue. Well, you know, Jesus did it all, and the grace of God is going to cover it all, and everything is all, and everything is all. So, it's, really, so Jesus did it all. Are there abortion clinics here? I thought Jesus did it all, so why are we still killing people? Yes? Yes. So is, that a, is, is there still a fight on the go? Yes. Are those abortion clinics current today? Yes. Therefore, we are feeding an altar. 
Do you want stats? How many millions you are feeding to the altars of this country every day? If this altar is not God's altar, who are we empowering over our lives? Yes? Okay. So let's go to Matthew 23. Uh, I'm going to go to 29. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you build the tombs of the of the prophets and adorn the monuments of the righteous. Who is speaking? Jesus. He's very rude, you know. He's not politically correct for today's church. I really don't know that this speech would have been allowed in any church today. And say, if we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. You know, we wouldn't have done all the sins they did. <laughs> yes. Therefore, you are witnesses against yourselves. Who's speaking? Jesus. What is he reading? He's reading their thoughts and the intentions of their hearts. Have they said this in front of him? No. He's reading back to them what they are saying in their hearts. And he's judging the fact that they're all around the prophets, whatever, you know, bringing offerings and gifts and doing whatever they're doing. And Jesus is saying, excuse me, but you're the same people as those people that killed them. And they're going, no, 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 it's not us. Okay, let's read this thing. Therefore you are witnesses against yourselves that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of your father's guilt. Serpents, brood of vipers, how can you escape the condemnation of hell? Therefore, indeed, I send you prophets, wise men and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify, and some of them you, you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city. Then on you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth. I told you, this is not politically correct. I mean, how can you tell this to human beings, Jesus? I thought you were a savior. Okay. From the blood of righteous Abel, from the first person who died, to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar, surely I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. I just want to explain to you, if we are heading to deal with some of the greatest wickedness that has ever been released on the planet, then every mantle of wickedness is gathering together. Right? So then we have to make sure that nothing of that stuff is in there. Whether it's through my great uncle's own sister through marriage, I don't care. I'm going to repent until there's nothing in here. So when the principality comes for an inspection and he has a look and says, well, um, yes, it's in there. I don't care how it got there, I'm getting it out. I don't care who got it there, I'm getting it out. I don't care how uh, the weakness came into my genetics in the spirit, I'm getting, I'm repenting it right out of there. Yes. Everybody here? Why? Because we have to. Because in the end times, every mantle of everything that's ever been released, right? from Adam, Abraham, and everybody else is going to come into one mantle. Because there's going to be, it's not an even fight. Okay? But God is not going to let us stand in our single anointing and deal with what we're going to deal with. We're going to stand with every person in God's government, on God's trading floor, who's on God's side. So I'm going to have the judicial history of Moses behind me. I'm going to have Elijah's skill at dealing with Jezebel behind me. I'm going to have Hudson Taylor's ability to pray and move a nation behind me. Yes. If I line up into my position, how are we doing? in heavenly places. How are we doing? And allow all of that to be my inheritance. 
Because when I speak, they all speak with me. And when I say something, we will be one voice. How are we doing? But you have to hear what they're saying. Which means you can't speak your words. Okay? And it's not going to be your way. And it's going to be in the protocol of walking in heavenly places. How are we doing? Okay? Which means then I have to divorce everything that doesn't look like that in me. You have to take off before you can put on. Yes? You have to empty out before you can fill up. Right? How are we doing? Okay. So, how do you like that so far? There's an accumulation of mantles. There's going to be a powerful confrontation. And I'm in it. And I'm so excited. And we are here to empower you to get excited. <laughs> Instead of saying, oh, no, I can't do this. He's going to go, great. I don't know what's going to happen, but this is going to be great. This is going to be like a ride. This is going to be like, uh, what do you call it, the six flags. This, I'm going to go all the way screaming. <laughs> And I'm going to do a few twirly things like that. But baby, I'm going to get up on the other side and find my breath. Because all the prayers of all the saints have prepared us. We think glory is miracles. Do you think people were growing legs and feet and all of that when Jesus says the glory that was before the foundation of the earth that we had. Do you think anybody needed gold teeth? Are you hearing what I'm saying? I want you to hear. I don't, I don't uh, despise any of it. But I'm saying I want you to understand this is the flapping of the veil. We haven't gone through yet to where the ark actually is. We haven't gone through yet. Because to go through, we have to go through the mantles of the fathers and the mothers. And they have held places in the glory with their lives and they died there. And so when you go through that mantle, you actually have to go through their lives Apparently, by the time Jesus came, you had to, we would, could have taken 16 horses on chariots to pull apart that veil that was rent. Because all the mantles, all the priests' garments of the priests that died, they put up as part of the veil. So this thing had grown like three foot deep. Okay, and when the high priest came to stand before the veil, some said he would hold the blood in the one hand, the golden altar in the other, if you look in the book of Hebrews, and he would be literally transported through that veil onto the other side. Some said he would walk through the veil, and there were like narrow passages, because narrow is the way that leads to life. Whichever way you want to look at it, People had put their mantles there, their whole lives of prayer and fasting and being in that temple. Picture. Picture the cloud of witnesses. Some of them have died. Some of them have died literally unto blood. They have laid down their mantle to hold a place in the glory so that we who are lost can be first. Because they're going to hold a place. Abraham right in the beginning. Moses right in the beginning. Elijah also near the beginning. And so on and so forth until we get to Azusa Street. When we start to enter this thing, we're going to go through it all. 
We have access to the inheritance of it all. And when you go through, you're going through their literal lives. Because remember that the house is anointed before the person. Before Aaron and the priesthood are put into place, the house and the furniture is anointed. And what is anointed is the garment and not the flesh. And Abraham's mantle passes on. I mean, Aaron's mantle passes on to Eliezer, remember? Apparently, the garment was never pulled in, extended, let out, made shorter, made taller, because the garment would just fit. Apparently, the same garment made for Aaron would fit the high priest where there was fat, thin, tall or short. Smile. How are we doing? It was the rest of the Levites, their garments made up the curtain. So the garment that we're about to wear for this end time war we're going in has been paid for in blood is now carrying such a weight of glory, such a weight of anointing of the work and the obedience of so many who have gone before us to do what they were sent to do. And then when we put it on for this latter day, we are clothed with everything that they've already accomplished and we just have to finish the last leg and take the baton from those who have gone before. This is what our spiritual inheritance DNA looks like. Are you happy about that? To have it, you have to give up your physical inheritance. This is a deal. Yes? How's this for a deal? We have to be grafted into a tree, an oak of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, because the Lord's going to deal with the roots of the tree we come from. Yes. So we have to come out of Stonehenge and out of Indian altars, and out of African altars, and out of whatever altars, where we have traded we have to give that up and say I don't want this as my inheritance I want my inheritance only through the blood of Calvary and the cross of Jesus I only want that which is written in my book I want nothing else I want nothing more and I want nothing less because if Jesus wrote this thing in his blood, it has to be the perfect plan. And I agreed with this somewhere in him in the beginning. And so somewhere in your glorified, very intelligent state, because some of you are going, I could never have chosen my husband, my wife, my brother, my sister. <laughs> Yes, you did. And the reason you did was because you needed a challenge <laughs> to chisel you into the shape you needed to be to do the job you were sent to do. Don't you know the enemy is just a servant who's there to test you so that you get to do your job. He even got to do that with Jesus. If you say, you are the son of God, blah, blah, blah. If you, hello? How many times have you heard this little voice saying to you, who do you think that you are? 
Did anybody hear that? Smile and say, I think that I am everything my father thinks. And I don't even know the extent of what he thinks. Hallelujah. It's not what you think. It's what he thinks. Because what he thinks, he has written. What he has written, he's paid for with his son's blood. How's that? I don't care who prophesied over your life. If it's not in the book, that was a false prophecy. Hello? Maybe it was the idol in your heart that stand, stood up and said to the prophet, prophesy to me, I want the house, I want the car, and meet my need now. And the prophet needed money to get home. Or something. Not my problem. We need to come into agreement with what God has already established. What has he established? His government is already established. What's the problem? We are supposed to make this place, Colorado Springs, reflect that place if we say we are the Ecclesia. Hello? If we are the Ecclesia, why is there abortion? Let me tell you. Welsh Revival. What happened to the police force? They came to church because there was nothing to do. Why? Because the government of God arrived. Hello? Do you see policemen having spare time in the city? Why is that? We don't have enough policemen in Africa. But he's very Christian. Rwanda's very Christian, you know. Was in like nearly 90% Christian. But when that rubber hit the road, the one tribe is going to kill the other tribe. And in churches, by the way. Burn them down. Just happened in Kenya the other day. Smile. 70%, 80% Christian? Christian. What Christian? What have we got? The form and no power. Why? Because we're so busy having our needs met. So shall we repent? Let's stand. Do that. Let's do some business, shall we? Before I ask, yes, please stand. If you're repenting, I'd like you to stand. If you don't want to repent, sit. <laughs> but if you're standing, it's a voluntary issue. That's why I'm saying stand. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, we want to come and repent. For pure selfishness. For everything in the church being about me. For every ministry being about me and my needs. For every ambition of my heart being about myself. Lord, I am selfish. And worse than that, I am not worshipping you. Lord, I want to confess that I don't really love your son. And I don't appreciate the blood of his sacrifice. I'm not passionate about what you are passionate about. I am not passionate about what the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is passionate about. I have reserved the right to have my own lusts and my own passions. And today, Lord, I want to come to your mountain and say, teach me your ways so that I can walk before you with integrity and begin to be passionate 
about the right things. Lord, I repent. Because everything around me reflects me. I decorate my world with my passion. And I repent for that. And Lord, I am not ready for the fight in these end days. Teach me. Equip me. Empower me. Father, don't let me abuse the fivefold ministry to meet my needs. But let them meet your needs for me to come into the stature of the measure of the fullness of Christ. I want to measure up to the glory I was in, in my Father in the beginning. And I don't want to come before you on Judgment Day and I am not whole, spirit, soul and body. I want to be presented before you spirit, soul, and body, whole and holy, the way that I was sent from heaven in the first place. Now help me change the way I think and help me think deliberately. Let every thought and intention of my heart be something that pleases you. In Jesus' name.